one of my favorite draft guys and one of the most accurate draft guys in all of football tells us about some players that should be a little bit higher on everyone's board and should be a little bit lower and gives us a Texans target for day three. Welcome into the channel. I'm Cody Stutes. Let's talk some Texans and let's talk with my friend Mike Lachine from NFL Rough Draft. I've known Mike for a few years. I'll explain why he's so fun to talk draft with and then we're going to go through some of the players that Mike is a little bit higher on than everybody else and a little bit lower on than everybody else. You don't want to miss this conversation. And towards the end, a Texans target that Mike's got me. Mm, got me excited to think about ending up in a Texans uniform. Here's that conversation. My buddy, Mike Lachine, NFL rough draft. And Mike, let's make sure I get the accolades correct here because you – and your partner, Ray, have NFL Rough Draft. I've got the link in the description down below for everybody. But there's a website called the Huddle Report that tracks draft accuracy, top 100 accuracy in the draft. And you guys are not one time, not two time, but three time top 100 champions. You're one of the most accurate sites when it comes to the draft and talking about the NFL draft. Yeah, thank, wow, thank you. That's a great introduction. Um, you know, unfortunately, we lost our title of being the most accurate uh, draft site this past year. But we're, you know, we'll see what we could do this year. Maybe get that back. Um, but yeah, um, you know, we've we've had some luck, and um, also had a little bit of bad luck because we had Amon Ra, St. Brown, Max Crosby, and Dak Prescott in our top 100, and we lost points for them because they they were all day three picks. Oh man. Oh man. See, that's the, that's the beauty of the draft is like, I guys like you are great to talk to because it's not one through 32 that I think is super important. And I would tell you the GMs one through 32, they do a pretty decent job. It's rounds two, it's rounds three. It's finding guys in round four, round five, round six, that should have been in the top 100 should have been round two guys should have been round three guys. I mean, there are guys that drafted, you know, wide receivers in the first round last year that I'm sure if they go back, they'd put Tank Dell on their squad. You know, he wouldn't last. And I mean, I mean, I remember you messaging me uh, last training camp, like, "Hey, tell me a little bit more about Tank Dell and stuff like that." It's like I think what you guys do and and, and the stuff that you you put together, it's so much fun. You and I have talked football for years. I don't remember the first draft, but I remember I caught you guys right as you were really taking care of some business with the top 100s. And it's just it's just so fun to see, uh, you know, some of my buddies have these accolades. And uh, watch out, everybody. They're coming for that title yet again. <laughs> All right, Mike, let's talk a little bit about, because you do this, because you put these guys in the top 100, you, sometimes you differ on guys that maybe the consensus or the public generally like. So let's start with just a guy. Give me a guy. Give me a name about somebody that you, an NFL rough draft, or maybe a little bit higher on than what everybody else is saying and putting together with this player. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, you're completely right about, you know, building your team through rounds two through seven, you know, you, you put together a couple of good drafts and then you've got those guys on four year deals for, you know, very cheap. Um, so that's what it's all about. And, you know, to start with a guy who I'm a little bit higher on, I think that the consensus is Jalen Wright, the running back out of Tennessee. So I'd say that at this point, I don't want to say it's unanimous, but it's pretty close to unanimous that just about everyone's got Jonathan Brooks as running back one. And he might be the, the first running back picked. I mean, it makes sense. He's coming off the torn ACL, but it sounds like he'll be ready for camp. Um, but Jalen Wright, to me, you know, he reminds me a little bit of a, of a former Tennessee running back, Alvin Kamara. Mm. Um, you know, I, I have him in the second round. Um, some people don't think he's going to go until day three. Wow. I think at some point on day two, though, um, an NFL team is going to be smart enough to take a shot on Jalen Wright. Uh, again, the reasons why I like him, he's big, he's athletic. Um, he showed that he's got immediate value in the passing game. He caught a lot of passes. Um, he's good in pass protection. And when it comes to running backs playing right away, pass protection is one of those big deals. Like They could develop it at the pro game. Um, but when they come into the league already having the ability to do it, they're able to get on the field quicker and into their rookie season. So he's got that, you know, big production and in the SEC too. He averaged almost seven and a half yards per carry. 
course, went to the combine and lit it up. Um, a lot of those yards per carry, too, he, he had a lot of yards after first contact, which, you know, again, yeah, playing in the SEC, it's not like he's, <laughs> you know, those yards are, you know, after first contact with future accountants. Um, right. <laughs> you know, there's some good defense in the SEC. So Jalen Wright's been our running back one since October. He's going to be our running back one on our final board when it comes out next Tuesday. A little bit higher on him. Man, I would be, I would just be shocked. I think our, I think our records, what, 2014, Bishop Sankey was the first back and it was like 54 or something like that. I, I, I would be floored if Jalen Wright, or, or to an extent, maybe Jonathan Brooks, you know, and I, I, I know I, I'm with you. I like Wright a little bit more than Brooks as well. I mean, I don't see how Wright gets out of the top 40. I mean, even if it's just some team that has a couple of extra picks or has multiple picks, but like, I don't see how he gets out of the top 40. I mean, I don't, I know I saw somebody today, the, uh, they were, they cover the Cowboys and they're like, guys, the, the latest, the first running backs ever gone is 54. The Cowboys pick 56. They're not getting the first running back. And I was like, yeah, they're not getting the first running back because the first running back's got to go in the first 40 picks. Like, I'd be really surprised with kind of what you talked about, the the package that he's put together and doing it in the SEC. It's going to be really intriguing to see exactly what team wants to put that guy uh, into use right away. Because I would think that short of getting on a team with somebody who's already established, he's going to play pretty quick. And, you know, even if he is on a team with somebody who's established, I look at him, another guy he's kind of comparable to is Devon A-Chain. You know, Mostert had a great year last year, but there was still plenty of room for A-Chain to produce and, and have a big rookie season, at least when he was when he was healthy. Okay, all right. So from a guy that you're a little bit higher on to a guy that maybe you're a little bit lower on, some, some other folks like this guy a lot more, and maybe what you and the guys in NFL Rough Draft have kind of put together it's like, eh, we're not quite seeing it like everybody else. Yeah, for me, you know, it's it's the the fifth through seventh quarterbacks. And I know everybody's talking about Penix and Knicks. And, you know, the way I look at it is, first of all, you've got probably about five or six quarterbacks in the entire league who you can win a Super Bowl with. And, you know, so the benchmark's already set pretty high. Um, you know, the top four are going to probably be the top four picks. Um, so then you get down to Penix and Bo Nix, and they showed up at the Senior Bowl. They had a chance to, uh, you know, sort of separate themselves from the pack, and they didn't. Um, you know, the the practice week was very mediocre. I was surprised that Penix decided he wasn't going to play in the game. Uh, Nix played like the first, he played the first drive, and I think completed three or four yeah. sort of check down passes. Um, I don't see it with them. I think that they could be quality you know, sort of quarterbacks in the league. But the the bar is kind of set higher than that if you want to win a championship. So, you know, I know some people are debating whether or not Penix or Knicks will go in the first round or day two. I don't really even see though them as uh, guys who are going to are gonna, teams are going to target at the top of day two. So in other words, like last year, Will Levis, you know, uh, the Titans traded up. I know Joey Porter was the first pick on day two, but uh, the Titans traded up, I think, right after that to take mm -hmm. Levis. It wouldn't surprise me if if Knicks and Penix are just sort of like they are day two quarterbacks who get picked at some point on day two. Um, you know, I, I think that maybe they're starting caliber quarterbacks, but again, like, are they championship or playoff caliber quarterbacks? Sure. I don't see it. Yeah, we are we are in the superstar quarterback era too like if you don't have a dude like you're not beating Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs like and, and we've seen it and even if you you are a dude you still might not beat them yeah. and so it, you've almost got it's it's so rare to see not to say that you can't get there because like a guy who's not a superstar can get there it's just hoisting the thing like I think you've got to be a, a a star right now just the way the league set up, the way the game is played. And then especially when you start thinking about some of these teams that maybe would take this Bo Nix or, or Pinnick swing, it's like you're in the AFC. Like, is Bo Nix ever going to be on the Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, C.J. Stroud level? Like, 
I can't see that. Like, I can't see that development. It's like, yeah, you need someone to take snaps and play, but like, you don't have to invest in that guy when maybe, you know, maybe there's a stud offensive tackle or one of these wide receivers or, or Bowers or, you know, any of these guys might make more sense than, you know, the fourth, fifth, sixth quarterback type stuff. Right. You know, the problem teams get it, the situation they get into is they take one of these guys and then the next year they need a quarterback again. And now you've wasted, you know, you've either traded into the late first round or, you know, you've wasted a second round pick and now the next year you still need that quarterback. And, yeah. you know, like you said, unless you've got a guy on a rookie deal, it's really hard to compete with a Patrick Mahomes or, you know, the other top three or four quarterbacks in the league. All right, let's flip it back over to a guy you like. Somebody you like in this draft, somebody that you're feeling good that's maybe creeping up your rankings that everybody's kind of slow to realize what they bring to the table. Yeah, I'm going to stay right in the SEC, but I'm going to go over to the defensive side of the ball with Trevin Wallace, the linebacker from Kentucky. Ooh, okay, this is fun. Okay. Yeah. So so he's a true junior, um, barely 21 years old. Of course, they changed the rule this year, so he was able to play in the Senior Bowl. So he went to the Senior Bowl, looked good there. I give him credit for not only practicing all week, but he played in the game. There's this new trend in the senior bowl where guys just like they they practice for a day or they have a couple good reps and then they shut it down for the rest of the week. Roman Wilson uh, did that. He played two days, he practiced two days, and then he was gone. He wasn't even there. He was just gone. Right. And I yeah. totally see where they're coming from. But you sure. know, you also have to hand it to some of these guys who stick it out and play in the game, even when they've had pretty good weeks. Um, because you know, a lot of times they're playing every snap because there just aren't a lot of guys who are left by the time they get to Saturday. So he played in the game, looked pretty good. Um, now, he was a big recruit out of high school, and he backed that up with his three years in the SEC at Kentucky. Um, he was productive, not just against the run, but in coverage as well. And, you know, so that, that's always been the big thing for us when we're trying to distinguish a linebacker between a day two guy or day one or day two, and a day three guy. You know, usually it's can you hold up and stay on the field on third down? Or nowadays it's more than third down because the league passes so much. But he absolutely can. Um, and this is a guy where, you know, he's sort of been in some of the rankings I've seen, he's sort of on that day two, day three bubble. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. You know, you look at some of his, some of his numbers. So again, I already mentioned he was a big recruit and he backed it up playing in the SEC, had a good show at the Senior Bowl. Um, so even before the combine, we knew he was athletic. Um, but again, he had the same height, weight, and arm length and the same exact 40 time at the exact same age as Roquan Smith, Ooh. who was the eighth pick in the draft in 2018. Now, I'm not saying he's exactly Roquan Smith, but I'm also not saying he should be the eighth pick in the draft. You know, for me, this is a guy who has got that same production in the SEC. He's got that same athleticism. In fact, his broad jump and his vertical were much better than Roquan Smith's. Mm. Um, obviously played with a lot less talent than that, 2000, that 2018 Georgia defense was loaded. Right. Um, so for me, this is a guy who's a day two lock. Um, and, and I'm not really sure why he's not getting the, the buzz that, I think he deserves. I mean, look, you, you you tell me that he's a linebacker that can cover and he's athletic, and even if he needs a little seasoning, I I mean, I think everybody's looking for Fred Warner, like, and that guy is linebacker that can cover, super athletic, and needed a little bit of seasoning, and he got it in San Francisco, and he turned into a monster, and so it's like, I love, I love guys who played well. Even if it was, okay, it's Kentucky, and sometimes you scout the helmet on accident. You, you pay attention to where they went. Um, I love guys that have success, back up a high ranking, showcase the athleticism, and it's like, I've done everything right in the draft process. Why is the draft process not being kind to me? Like, like wh wh where am I missing? And, I mean, I, I, I've seen, like, the, you know, the projections and stuff. It feels like he's going to go – day two it feels like he's going to go round three and i like you kind of putting the flag on it's like hey this is a round two guy and it's not it look it's not the best linebacking group we've ever seen from a draft standpoint so if you get a little gym 
you know, you you shape him up after a couple of years. That's a really nice player that you have. Yeah. And he's 21 years old still, too. Barely 21 years old. Yeah, but look, that that's that's something that I've learned, you know, and we maybe have another couple of years of it. And and I think you can probably speak to this, especially, you know, from a quarterback standpoint, but it's had other positions. We've got some old players in this draft. Like, like there's some guys that are like 25 years old this season. And it's like, you know, there was transfers and the extra years and the COVID year and, you know, stuff like that. And the NCAA, sometimes they're not great, but sometimes they're very generous with the guys. And, you know, some of these guys are, are, are old prospects. Um, yes. And for him to be one of the, you know, hey, I was a big prospect. I played my three years. Now I'm going to go be a professional football player. Like, I, I do kind of like that. I do kind of like that from him. Exactly right. And to speak to that, Keaton Bills, he's a guard with uh, Utah. He's in the same Utah recruiting class as Zach Moss. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> now done with his rookie contract and, you know, moved on. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Okay. Uh, let's do let's do one more guy that you're a little lower on than, than everybody else, and then one more good guy, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. And that gives people kind of a little – a little group to pay attention to as this thing goes. So give me one more guy that you're not quite seeing it like everybody else is seeing it. All right. Well, it's such a strong receiving class. And so you're going to have some good options in round one, round two, you know, even in round three, you're going to have a lot of um, good receiving, good receiving let, options. Let me jump in here because sure. I feel like this, and this has been hard for me too, because I, I there, there's 20 different receivers that I could convince myself that like, Oh, I could see them playing on Sunday and playing well on Sunday. It's been harder this year to find criticism of the receivers. It feels like it's like a like a like an era of good feelings around these receivers. Now, you know, you can you can find some people that are critical and, and, and get kind of you know in the minutiae on some of these guys. And then you know, I've seen some some, you know, in the recent week or so, like some flat out, this guy can't play, don't do it. But like it feels like it's been very kind of Ooh, everybody's going to catch the ball. Everybody's doing well. So I'm excited to hear what you're about to say here. I'm excited. Yeah, so I'm going to give you two quick ones and sort of just lump them together. But Xavier Leggett, I think he's going to go high. You know, everybody's got him in the second round. That's probably, I'm guessing, where he'll go. He gives me Corderell Patterson vibes, though. Oh, wow. Um, you know, so again, you have the SEC connection. Patterson went to Tennessee. Um, Leggett over there at South Carolina. And, you know, I can I can live with the one-year wonder deal um, because you see a lot of guys who have one, you know, one-year production and they go on to have productive NFL careers. Like Leighton Van Der Eschen is a linebacker, but still he, he sort of fits in that category right off the top of my head. So he, he does have that. It took him until his fifth year until he really did anything. Um, broke out this year. Um, but he's sort of kind of just one of these height, weight, speed guys, in my opinion. Uh, you know, he wasn't super impressive at the senior bowl. Um, of course, tested off the charts like everybody knew he would at the combine. But, you know, you see these guys sort of constantly uh, rated a little bit higher than where they end up producing. And so I think one of the reasons why Ray and I have been able to have the success that we've had is – you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We sort of look back and see, well, who is this player comparable to from the past and how did they work out? So Cordero Patterson, first round pick, you know, he's had a productive NFL career, but, you know, people thought that he was going to be Julio Jones and he certainly hasn't right. done that. He wasn't um, a game changer. Exactly. And I think you can put LaVisca Chenault in that same group as well. Where, okay, yeah. You know, a lot of people thought he'd be a first round pick. I believe he was like a mid second round pick. Uh, my memory is a little bit foggy. I'm pretty sure he went in the second yeah, round. Yeah, that sounds about right. And again, he really hasn't he hasn't had a very productive career because it's height, weight, speed, but you know, he can't run routes, and that's really big for receivers. Yeah. And the second guy is Brendan Rice. Um mm. Brendan Rice gets a lot of love because he's Jerry Rice's son. And I don't think there's anything wrong with Brendan Rice, but I don't think that he's this game-changing wide receiver who you're going to consider um, in round three. It would shock me to see him go there. For me, he's round four. Um, you know, if I were going to give you a comparison for him, sort of like a Josh Reynolds. Like, all right, Josh Reynolds is a nice player. 
If Josh Reynolds is your third or fourth receiver, okay, that's pretty nice. And, you know, you have him on his rookie deal, okay, so that he's making under a million dollars. That would be good too. But to me, that's really nothing more than like a an early day three pick. Okay. All right. So, and look, that's where, that's where you can kind of, you know, you sneak one out, out of the top 100 that some other guys might be sneaking in. That's where you kind of look, look, look at is, I mean, the story's great. The production at just one year, I think scares a lot of people. I think a lot of people watch him work out and watch him run routes and they try to put DK Metcalf on him. And like, in a in a great scenario in like a best case outcome like he might be that guy but i think the biggest thing with this is okay we know what the best case is we know what the worst case is how likely is it like and and like it just doesn't seem likely that Xavier Leggett ends up being another DK Metcalf as often as he turns out to be like you said like Cordero Patterson and then Rice look i, I, I think the thing that i can consistently sticks out to me about him is at the senior bowl, guys were all over him. Um, sometimes it was pass interference and the officials were like throwing the flag. Sometimes guys were just handsy with him. And like he fights through contact, but I don't want a guy constantly fighting through contact. Like it's like it just I don't I can't have a guy who doesn't have any sort of top end skill associated with his game not have the ability to separate. Like just guys are constantly around him. And at some point, I want my guy to be away from the, the defense not trying to beat the defense every single time he goes out there. Yeah. Um, all right, one last guy that you're a little bit higher on, that you and the NFL Rough Draft crew have put together, put the minds together, you and Ray, and you figure out we're a little bit higher on this guy than everybody else. Uh, we're a little bit higher on Jonah Ellis. Um, you know, I think Jonah Ellis is kind of looked at as being sort of like one of these situational pass rushers, and they usually go early day three. I think Joan Ellis should be a, a lock for the top 100. Okay. Um, so he had the labrum and, you know, he missed a lot of the off season because of that. Um, but he's another one who just turned 21 years old, uh, had ridiculous production this year. I think he had 12 sacks, 16 or 18 tackles for loss or something like that. Um, he had a six, six, nine, three cone in his pro day. Six, six, <laughs> nine. And the three cone is super important for edge rushers. You look at most of the, the top edge rushers in the league, they'll have sub seven second three cones or right around seven seconds. Six, six, <laughs> nine. So, you know, I, I really like this guy. Um, I, and it's, again, you missed three games at the end of the year. How many sacks would this guy have had if he played the whole season? Sure. Um, so I could see him sort of starting off as one of these situational pass rushers. But I think he's one of those guys who has, again, uh, sort of like we were talking about um, earlier, um, he's got some potential to sort of grow into a bigger role. I kind of, I mentioned Max Crosby earlier, kind of look at him the same way. If you look at old combine film of, uh, of Max Crosby working out, he doesn't look like the same guy he looks like now. Right. He got into the weight room, you know, he was a pro for a few years and he developed into this, monster edge rusher and you know with, with with ellis i don't know if he has quite that much growth potential but you know if, if he if, if he just fills out just a little bit more i think he's an every down player and he's going to be a, a menace in the backfield um so okay a couple things i love about him as i just kind of glanced through the profile you mentioned the sacks 12 sacks consensus all american which you know catches your eye uh, first team all pack 12. So the competition level's high, you know, it's not, it's not exactly the sec or big 10, but it's not bad. And, um, born in Moscow, Idaho. I mean, what a great, what a great, I didn't know Idaho had a Moscow, but born in Moscow, Idaho. Um, look, I think when you're thinking about pass rushers, I don't care what the system is. If the guy eats quarterbacks, the guy eats quarterbacks. So, find a way to put him on the field, find a way to get his skills on the field. If he can do something. And if you're talking about, I mean, a guy, you get production at the pass rush from a late third rounder or a fourth rounder. And it is just 
I mean, we talk about found money. That's like found gold. Pass rushers are a hundred million dollars. Free agent pass rushers are twenty-five million dollars a year. We just saw it with the Texans and Daniel Hunter. You know, even guys like you know Jonathan Grenard get big time money. Um, if you can get a guy that's in there, maybe it takes a year to figure it out. But once he figures it out, if he can rush the the quarterback and he's a cheap asset, it's just beautiful for your team. All right, so I'm, I'm putting a pin on it. You, you're planting the flag on him. I'm going to take a couple extra set of eyes on him and 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 pay a little bit closer attention. Jonah Ellis from Utah, okay? Yeah, Cody, it goes back to what you said at the top of the show. You know, you get these second through seventh round picks. They're not making anything for the first four years of their career. So if you get one of these guys in a premier position like the edge, like you mentioned, that's, you know, that's how you end up winning championships. You got to listen. When Mike Lachine is telling you, I like this guy a little bit more, I like this guy a little bit less, you got to listen. He and his partner, Ray, at NFL Rough Draft are the three-time, three-time, three-time champions when it comes to putting together top 100 boards. They do it better than teams in the NFL. That's how good they do it. Okay, and they're coming for their championship, everybody. So you guys better watch out. Mike, we got so much more that we're going to talk about. That was guys that you're higher and lower on. I'll cover the Texans, though. We want to know. We want to pick the brain of a big-time draft guy like you about what this Texans team should be chasing. So the folks got to be watching out for that one. Great stuff from my guy, Mike Lachine. Appreciate him jumping on. So many more conversations to come with him, including Texans needs. And we'll see if Mike breaks my heart when we go through some of my draft crushes with him in another video in the link in the description down below you can find everything you need to know about mike lachine nfl rough draft and some of the great stuff that they put together also in the description you can find out about the draft party next week don't miss it daily sports club next saturday we're gonna have so much fun we'll talk about days one and two we'll be there for day three rounds four five six and seven that's a lot of numbers don't worry about it the number you need to know is 922 holman street that's right 922 holman street daily sports club don't miss it be there be on the lookout too for how you can win a new texans jersey customized with your youtube name on it you don't want to miss out on that that information is coming soon so be looking for that in the videos and the descriptions. Good stuff. Hope you enjoyed the video. Appreciate you watching and can't wait till we talk Texans in the draft again soon.